Welcome to Ask the Astro Shaman. Uh, when I launched this feature a couple of weeks ago, um, I originally assumed I'd be doing this in writing, but it occurred to me, hey, why not make videos? It'll be even more fun. Uh, it fits um, a need I've had to want to communicate with you guys more directly um, and more interactively. So I think this will be a lot more fun than just uh, putting words on paper or words on a computer screen. Also, as you can tell, I'm improvising. I don't have a script. I want these to be very casual. I will probably mess up here and there. I'll just leave it in. I don't want to edit these at all. I'm not going to go into my video editing program and do stuff to them. I'm just going to do them and pop them up and, and make it just like I'm having a real conversation with you guys. So here we go. Uh, two questions came in for Ask the Astro Shaman since I announced it. And let me pop over there and have a look at what they are. So <clears throat> the first question is from Chrissy White in Oxfordshire, UK. Hope I said that right. She writes, first, I would like to say I do enjoy your informative videos and emails. I've been studying astrology for 45 plus years and have been taught by some excellent people. My real love is horary, which I find does really work. The question I would like to ask though, is why do you use the small planets, Ceres, Pallas, Vesta, etc.? Do you not feel you have enough to work with, i.e. usual planets, aspects, and minor aspects? It's something I've noticed with American astrologers and not with us here in the UK. We'd love to hear back from you and your thoughts. Very best wishes, Chrissy White, Oxfordshire, UK. So thank you for your great question, Chrissy. <clears throat> and I would like to address that. Actually, uh, I waited several years after being exposed to the minor asteroids before I started using them but I have found that they add a great deal of value to my work, and I'll explain why after I take a little sip of water here. <clears throat> so there's four major asteroid goddesses, Ceres, Juno, Pallas, and Vesta. And here's what they add that I don't get any other way. Um, Ceres is a very interesting asteroid goddess. Her basic myth is that uh, she's more popularly known as Demeter, uh, the myth of Demeter and Persephone, her lovely daughter. Uh, Ceres deeply loved Demeter. They loved hanging out together. Then one day, uh, Pluto, the lord of the underworld, came up. He raped uh, Persephone. He dragged her down to the underworld. And Ceres went into deep mourning. And this lasted for six months. And things were getting pretty serious because Ceres was the grain goddess. When she was in sorrow, nothing grew. And the whole planet was in danger of starvation. So the gods had to work out a compromise. And without getting into too much detail, basically the deal was that Persephone could come back up and be with her mom for six months, that spring and summer. And then she did have to go back and be with Pluto as the queen of the underworld during fall and winter. And that's the mythological explanation of the seasons. So therefore from Ceres, we get the themes of uh, abundance because the grain goddess harvests lots of good stuff. And simultaneously, we get the theme of sorrow and release and return and dealing with your shadow work. And in fact, I used to see these as two totally unrelated themes, but now I've observed in my own experience and have seen confirmed by others that doing your shadow work well actually opens abundance. Abundance, not just financial, but think about energy flow. If I'm all blocked up in my heart and in mourning and sorrow, then I've got a major shutdown in the amount of energy that can come into me because I've got no outflow. It's all clogged up. So as I deal with my shadow work, release my sorrow, open up, then the flow starts happening and more energy comes in. Abundance, I define not just as money, but as anything of value. And I consider spiritual energy probably one of the greatest important things of all. So basically do deal with your sorrow, deal with your loss, do the shadow work, open the flow, abundance comes in. So both of her meanings actually have a very powerful connection. So there are other planets that deal with loss and sorrow. Um, Chiron and Pluto come immediately to mind, but Ceres um, can really give an additional accent point to both those things. There are other planets that deal with abundance. Uh, Venus is money. Pluto, again, is great wealth, potentially. But Ceres, I find, if she's powerfully placed, can be really helpful. Uh, let me mention, too, how I use asteroid goddesses. I, do, I don't consider them on the same level usually as the other planets, but I kind of think of them like you would deal with a fixed star. Um, the basic guidance if you're doing a fixed star is it's within one degree of conjunction of a 
important point, then you pay attention to that big star. Now, I'm a little more liberal with the asteroid goddess. I say, wow, if they're making a significant aspect, especially a quadrature, a conjunction, an opposition, or a square, then I get really interested in what that uh, uh, asteroid goddess is up to. If they're heavily aspected, really strongly interwoven into one or more chart points that are important, then I will you know, notice them. If they're not really connected, I don't really pay much attention. So um, that's how I work with them overall and how Ceres in particular plays in. Although Ceres is not my, I have two that I, uh, I wouldn't say are favorites, but I tend to use more and find that they have powerful resonance. As I said, Ceres shares meanings with other planets. Juno is an asteroid goddess I find I will, she's one of the two along with Pallas that I do a lot of work with. Um, <clears throat> Juno is committed partnership. And of course, for most people, partnership is a huge important thing. So Juno um, committed partnership, if she's strongly tied in, um, that becomes powerful. In fact, in the current podcast I just put up for mid-January 2019, um, the, I spent an hour talking with um, the lady I did, who, I'm sorry, proper name is coming out of my head, uh, Cheyenne was her name. And um, she knew she had a Sun-Pluto conjunction opposing the moon in her natal chart, which he didn't know till I told her was that they both squared Juno, creating a uh, T-square. And that made it even more intense around the importance of relationship. That Juno brought in the theme of committed partnership that wouldn't have been there if she had just known about the opposition. <clears throat> so Juno really drives home the theme of important committed partnership. Uh, normally one thinks of a romantic partnership, but any kind will do. Yes, in the myth, Juno was the wife of Zeus, it was a marriage but it can be any kind of partnership, business, a good friend that you're in some kind of container with, even an open enemy you're tangling with. Um, any committed partnership is really illustrated more profoundly by Juno. Pallas Athena, wow, without her, I would have missed a big piece of my whole 2019 forecast because <clears throat> for most of the year, the big news is that Pallas Athena is in strong aspect with uh, Pluto and the lunar nodes and Saturn and Jupiter. So uh, the T-square that they form in the sky, which lasts, I believe, seven months, if I re recollect, is a huge theme for the whole year 2019. But I don't know about Pallas, I would have missed the whole theme. Pallas has a unique set of meanings that really don't get as fully embodied or embodied at all by any other planet. So Pallas is the warrior goddess. Um, she's the one who is our, our current mythology, probably Wonder Woman would be the most obvious example. But other similar examples, um, Black Widow of the Avengers, um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Xena the Warrior Princess, to give recent examples from like TV and film. But Pallas prefers not to fight. She'd much rather negotiate. She's really good at negotiation, politics, diplomacy. She can totally fight and be a, a very powerful warrior when she needs to be, but she'll always go for the soft approach first. So I think she's a super helpful archetype, especially for our time when there is so much just brutal power over domination, control, et cetera, going on. You know, what a beautiful example she holds of, wow, why can't we negotiate and work it out? And we come to a win-win. So Pallas Athena, because of those interesting array of of qualities, there is no other planet that's the female warrior that's uh, specifically, I mean, yes, Libra is the negotiator and Venus ruling her would relate to that, but when you see Venus, you don't first think, oh, negotiation, um, political resolution, you think of love and you think of money and you think of um, creativity. So Pallas has a unique set of circumstances, uh, not, not circumstances, but themes that are really distinctive to her. And, and thus, when she shows up in a meaningful way, those themes can be more easily elucidated than if she wasn't present. Finally, Vesta, um, the asteroid goddess whose main meaning is higher service. Um, yes, uh, that theme is a little bit there in Neptune and Pisces. Uh, selfless service is a theme, but it's not the first thing I think of when I think of Neptune or Pisces. Neptune Pisces, I think of spiritual awakening. I think of inspired creativity mostly, or I think of their low side expressions, which are unrelated to sacred service. So Vesta, which relates to the Vestal Virgins of Rome, is um, such a clear pointer toward, wow, uh, serving a higher cause beyond yourself. 
and uh, she's very, I'm, when I find her powerful in people's charts, in fact, those people tend to be very much about that. So again, she's a unique pointer to that theme that I just don't get as strongly anywhere else. I've seen her point that theme in charts that didn't have a strong Neptune or Pisces signature. Uh, Vesta has a secondary meaning that I don't usually bring out, but since we're discussing these astral goddesses in depth, I also use her for sacred sexuality, specifically sex magic. And uh, sex magic is where you use arousal or orgasm while holding the vision of what you're trying to manifest and use law of attraction empowered by that incredibly potent sexual force. And doing that helps manifest whatever you're holding in your mind more quickly. And this could be something you want for yourself, but it could also be, wow, I'm making love for world peace. I'm making love to try to bring a harmonious solution to this difficult situation out in the world there. Um, sexual, sexuality is a very potent force. And to focus an intention around that, that has nothing to do with the fact that you're making love, but again, the sexual energy is powering it, is another Vesta theme. Now, I have been um, contradicted by some people say, well, the, Vest the Vestal virgins, they're virgins. They didn't make love. If they made love, there were serious consequences. How are you bringing sex into this? But I'm going back beyond just that particular manifestation of the sacred feminine as expressed in Rome and going back to the predecessors in prior cultures where you did have the sacred prostitute, you did have women whose job was to be sacredly sexual. They would initiate young men into um, their sexuality in a beautiful and harmonious way. When the warriors would come back all, you know, fired up and in their more animalistic way, these women would make love with them and help coax them back into civilized energy. So um, the earlier versions in other societies before uh, Rome took them and made them celibate, you know, we're very much about sacred sexuality, and that's why I continue to incorporate that theme into Vesta. So to answer your question, I <laughs> got a little long-winded there, uh, Chrissy, but um, basically Ceres, Juno, Pallas, and Vesta carry very specific and relevant meanings that I find tremendously enrich my client work, and that is why I use them. So, um, and there I have just proved so helpful in the years I've incorporated them that I now consider them just a basic part of my chart work. So that's why. Great question. Thanks very much. We had one other Ask the Astro Shaman question, and this is from Mara. And uh, I'll just give her first name and her birth date in case you want to look at it. Again, I'm trying to keep these real clear. I'm not going to put up a chart for Mara like I would on the podcast, but let me just uh, give her data if you want to run her chart and look at it yourself. She's born November 12, 1994, 10 a.m in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, and I better spell that. Nijmegen is N as in Nancy, I, J, M as in mother, E, G, E, N as in Nancy. Again, N, I, J, M, E, G, E, N, the Netherlands. And the chart you should get should have Sagittarius rising at 12 degrees, 12 minutes, and you should see the moon in Pisces at 14 degrees, 43 minutes. So that's just to get the chart rolling. Her question, she says, um, she says, your podcast has really been an integral part of my year in finding myself. My question to you is this. I have a natal Venus retrograde in Scorpio in the 10th house. How does that affect me? I feel like Venus in Scorpio is a difficult placement on its own, but I'm curious what your thoughts are about it and its retrograde position. Hope to hear from you. Best wishes, Mara. So let's uh, first uh, deal with... Um, the way of astrological thinking. She says, I feel like Venus and Scorpio is a difficult placement on its own. One would think this if one is using old style interpretation where there are good and bad placements. Now, Venus is in fact considered to be, uh, I'm not sure if it's detriment or fall, but in a weakened position in Scorpio because she is a ruler of Taurus and any planet that is strong in one side, whether it's the ruler or simply exalted, the opposite sign is considered to be weaker in. So strong in Taurus, therefore weak in the opposite sign Scorpio, if you're using old style thinking. Uh, however, um, while I do use that kind of thinking in specialized circumstance, such as when I do electional astrology, uh, where the whole way you get to your answers is by thinking in good, bad terms, when I do psychological astrology or spiritual astrology, i.e. when I work with a client, I don't use that kind of thinking. I, I am more in line with people like Stephen Forrest or uh, Dane Rudyard who say, 
there's no good or bad here. It's just energy interacting. And in my experience doing over 7,000 charts, I find there's no such thing as an inherently bad placement. It can all be wonderful if you work with it consciously enough. So let's take Venus and Scorpio. Um, instead of thinking, oh, what a bad placement. Oh, it's retrograde, even worse. You know, retrograde is not bad. It's just a description of how the planet functions. But again, one level at a time. Venus and Scorpio. Um, let's think of its possibilities. Venus is relationship. That's her most popular interpretation. So a relationship theme in the sign of Scorpio. Scorpio loves to relate. Scorpio itself is the sign of blended energy. Your energy blended with something else or someone else. So it says, when I relate, I want to go deep. I want to be intense. I don't want a superficial, you know, uh, you know, artificial relationship. I want to go deep. I want to be honest. I want to be emotionally naked and open with this person. I want them to do the same with me. I want a real, authentic, deep relationship. If the relationship is sexual, you couldn't pick a better sign than Scorpio. Scorpio is the sign of sacred sex, where you're not just engaging with your five senses with your lover, but you're blending energy bodies. Whoa, how cool is that? Venus and Scorpio saying, wow, not just sex, but sacred sex, ecstasy on a whole new level beyond what you can get to just with your physical part. So that's lovely. Uh, what if we take Venus in terms of her meaning as money? Well, could you pick a better sign than Scorpio, the sign of great wealth? Yeah. So yeah, Venus and Scorpio opens the potential for tremendous wealth. Again, like I said earlier, wealth can be money. It can be anything you value. So anything you value can be there. What if you're an artist and you're using Venus in a creative mode? Well, Scorpio says no inhibitions, you know, put it out like you feel it. If what you're doing is uh, edgy or taboo or gets into explicit territory and everyone's comfortable with, then do it anyway. Venus and Scorpio says let it all out there. If you want to do cathartic creativity and use your creative modalities to help you work through your challenges, then Venus and Scorpio is a fantastic placement for that. So that's just looking at Venus and Scorpio without reference to the other factors. Now, what about retrograde? Now, a retrograde planet is not bad. It's just, it's either internalized a little more or it's delayed in its expression. So a Venus and Scorpio uh, retrograde, we would say, okay, it could be that some of these qualities will be coming out a little later in your life. So the things I just described on our high side, maybe those things won't be there immediately, but they'll blossom as you get into your later years. And later could be any time beyond now. Um, or it might be more internalized. You might uh, not relate super effusively, but more subtly. Things like that. Um, I will mention, just in passing, uh, this is beyond the scope of Mara's question, but Mara, you are a mega Scorpio. We would say you came to do your postdoctorate work in Scorpio. You have not just Venus in Scorpio, but also Mercury, the North Node, the Sun, Juno, Jupiter, and Pluto. Seven planets, or not, not planets, but seven points in Scorpio. There is nothing else in your chart that even comes close. So again, had I not looked at the whole chart and I've been strictly putting in terms of Venus in Scorpio, I would have given you one answer, but you know, you can't ever look at something in isolation. It's like if I'm putting together a jigsaw puzzle and I just look at one piece, I have not got the whole puzzle. And in fact, when, when Mara first asked her question, she only gave me the question without her natal data. I then asked, could you please send me the natal data so I can answer more meaningfully? So that's, that's a caution. Uh, the same reason um, I never look just at a person's sun sign. I get asked, like, oh, what sun sign would be good for me for a romantic partner? I say, not enough information. Uh, a synastry grid looks at several hundred combinations of planetary energies, and the sun is just one piece of a very large puzzle. So sun sign astrology is great. It, it helps keep astrology on the public eye. It's, it's true enough in a broad enough way that it's interesting and helpful at a, in a certain limited way, but it ain't the whole picture. So if you're going to look at anything, um, it's really helpful if you can at least get a cursory look at the whole chart and gain the larger perspective of everything. So Mara, your Scorpio is a huge, massive, you know, major theme in your life. And the fact that Venus is there along with all these other planets lets us know just how potent that is. But now back to your more focused question, I will expand onto uh, related points where I find it's helpful. Uh, another interesting thing is she mentioned in her email, Oh, Venus is in my 10th house. Well, depends on the house system. 
Uh, in some house systems, absolutely it is. But in my porphyry house system, she's solidly in the 11th house. And I'm not a quibbler on houses. I would say, well, then maybe it's helpful to think of her in the 10th and 11th houses, both. And maybe both interpretations have validity. However, in Mara's case, I get a get out of jail free card because um, in all the major house systems, whether you're using my system porphyry or Placidus or Coke or the major systems, you know, Libra is the midheaven in all those systems. All the other systems I mentioned only differ in how they divide the houses between the angles. The angles are always the same. And guess what, Mara, even though I show Venus in your 11th, I've got her ruling the 10th. So therefore, she is going to relate to all the 10th house themes because she rules that house. So I get to put her in both houses for the interpretation. So let's take Venus in Scorpio as a career ruler. What this suggests is, again, everything I've said, well, maybe a career would be great for you if it related to somehow, now again, astrology we say is archetypally predictive, not concretely predictive. I'm gonna give some broad umbrella ideas about career, and then you can fine tune into any of the thousands of particular job descriptions that would fit under this umbrella. Venus and Scorpio, well, it's a job where I relate with people in a really powerful, transformative way. One obvious thing is, oh, you could be some kind of therapist, working with people to help them transform in some way. Or even if you're not a therapist, somehow aiding and abetting positive change in the people you work with would be indicated here. You could be an artist, again, who does this transformational work. Uh, you could have a job where you make a whole lot of money, Venus and Scorpio on the money side again. Um, the Midheaven ruler retrograde might indicate possibly the real calling you're here to do might be discovered a little later. But I would go for it because Venus is loosely conjunct your north node and your sun is conjunct your north node. So the north node says life purpose. So there's enough of a, of a hint there that you know I would be going for the job that feels like you're getting paid to do your life purpose. And I wouldn't settle for less than that if it were me. Venus in the 11th, um, and I've also got the sun and the north node in the 11th. I've got Mercury virtually in the 11th. It's so late in the 10th that it might as well be in the 11th house. Anything super close to the next uh, planetary house cusp, forgive me, the next house cusp is wanted to be in the next house, and Mercury <clears throat> is less than half a degree out of the 11th. So not only is Venus in the 11th, but Mercury wants to be, the north node is, the sun is in the 11th. That's groups of people. <clears throat> and this says, wow, not only do I want to relate intensely one-on-one, -on -one, I want to relate strongly with a group. Maybe you would be involved in groups who do psychological work, who do deep shadow work processes, who are getting together not just superficially, but getting together, together to do some kind of deep, meaningful work personally. Maybe the group itself is involved in a larger level of transformational work. All that would, would fit beautifully with Venus and Scorpio in the 11th house. Um, also, in my porphyry house system, I have Venus ruling some other houses. Um, she is the ruler of the fifth house. Again, in porphyry, her sign Taurus completely covers that house and um, also is on the cusp of the sixth house. So I could also add to your Venus's meanings whatever the fifth and sixth house mean. The fifth house, I say broadly, is the Leo flavored house. So this says, okay, Venus and Scorpio, bring that to leadership. Bring that to the performer in the spotlight. Okay, performer in the spotlight, Venus the artist, any of the creative arts, including the performing arts are there. So that's just, wow, maybe you'll be out there doing some kind of creative expression in the world. Um, Venus is also just be a kid, hang out with kids, relate in a more fun and playful way. You don't have to be intense all the time just because Venus is in Scorpio. You can lighten up and have some fun too. Uh, rest and relaxation are indicated there. The fifth house has a super broad variety of meanings. But again, Venus also rules the sixth house, and that's uh, the house of service. So this says you, you probably have a love of helping people out and will do so in a way that isn't, again, just superficial. Anyone could do that kind of light, not that big a deal help, but some help that really makes a difference. Um, the sixth house is also the house of health. Now, your sixth house doesn't have anything in it in terms of a body, but the ruler in Scorpio suggests that when you get on board with your own personal transformation, your health will be stronger. Uh, Scorpio, by the way, I didn't even mention this, can be the occult. 
it's again, it's you blending energies with something else. In this case, your personality, Mara, is blending energy with the energies beyond the veil. So it could be that um, you would serve others possibly through some kind of occult practice, whether that's astrology, numerology, tarot, runes, mediumship, psychic stuff, whatever you're into. Um, and actually doing life affirming things in those realms could boost your health because anything related to the sixth house that is done on the high side can be health promoting, even if common sense wouldn't indicate that it seems to have nothing to do with health. Why would that matter? But astrology uses a different kind of logic. So, <laughs> so Mara, what I hope I've done here is said, oh, Venus and Scorpio, is that a bad thing? I've just spent several minutes going on and on and on about all the wonderful things that not only a Venus and Scorpio can do generically, but that your Venus and Scorpio with your particular setup can do for you. Again, the planets are just potential. You have free will. You can take anything in your chart, low or high. It's completely up to you whether you make gold out of it or suffer from it. But uh, I say my job as an astrologer is less prediction than uh, teaching. Help you understand what's the potentials here in this amazing soul framework I've set up for myself. I'm just scanning back over your email. I think I've covered your email, Mara, so I really appreciate your question. I appreciate the opportunity to go on at length here in my Ask the Astrologer segment, and we're wrapping it up. So both questions have been answered. Uh, I'm really excited and really enjoying this new video format. Um, so uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it too. And, and I'll put my little plug for me here at the end. If you want to work with me, uh, go to astroshaman.com. Under services, I do astrology. I do shamanic healing. I do life coaching. I do uh, spiritual awakening activation. And all that's uh, mentioned in all the services stuff. Uh, good stuff too. Lots of free stuff you can get into at astroshaman.com. So check it out if you like. And we're going to wrap it up. So this ends the very first Ask the Astrologer segment. And I look forward to doing many more. Thanks for being here.